So I'm talking about magnetoreception. So uh, before I start off, actually let me go into presentation mode here. Just a second. There you go. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to talk about reception. So uh, I'll just introduce the topic first and what it is. Uh, reception is just the ability for different organisms, and there's still a lot of different organisms that can do this, that can basically sense magnetic fields in on the Earth. Um, so uh, before we just talk about reception, I'm just going to go through a few other uh, mechanisms uh, different organisms use. To start off, for humans. Uh, so I'll bring it up to you guys first. Pretty easy question. How do us as humans, when you walk into a room, for example, if you're in front of a fire pit, how do you sense the environment? What do you get to feel? What do you get to experience that lets you uh, sense what you're in front of? Vision. Your senses, right? Uh, so you got your nose, you got your smell, you got your eyes, right? Even warmth, temperature, uh, sometimes pressure, you can sense that too. Uh, your movement in space and all of that, right? So us as humans, we have a lot of different mechanisms we use that can sense where we are. And uh, as well, well, you can use taste as well for some reason if you wanted to. Um, and other organisms can do the exact same thing. So there's organisms that can use phototaxis, which is just the ability to use light and to be attracted towards light. Chemotaxis, that's just using chemicals and be attracted towards chemicals. We do that as well, that's what our smell. So we use chemicals that uh, bind receptors in our nose and we can move towards the scent if we wanted to. And baryotaxis is just a uh, response to pressure. So this is just talking about how we have different senses and we have different mechanisms that we can use uh, just to uh, basically know what we're around and what environment we're in and then we can choose to either go towards something or move away from something. Now, uh, magnetoreception is kind of similar as well. It's the same type of sense, except instead of sensing a specific type of smell, a taste, a sight, what you're doing is you're sensing magnetic fields. There's a lot of different organisms that actually have to do to this. So a picture here is a sea turtle. Sea turtles have migrational patterns, just like birds do, and they're able to use magnetic fields uh, to guide where they're supposed to go. Uh, birds do this as well, and um, birds basically uh, they can travel from either the south hemisphere more towards the equator or the north hemisphere down to the equator as well. And this is really actually fascinating because um, a small change in trajectory at the start can actually cause a fatal result. So there's a research down done in South Australia where they found that one of the type of uh, natural birds they have there, if it lost trajectory by just over 5 degrees, it would be fatal and the bird would die uh, because of where it ended up. So it is really important that they have a very precise a way and a mechanism to travel to the equator. So they have a very um, precise way to detect where they're supposed to go. And the way they do this is magnetoreception. Uh, so they are able to sense different magnetic fields in the earth that tells them where to go. And uh, all this uh, slide is about, it's about convergent evolution. I think a lot of you guys would know about this. It's basically when different organisms evolve independently to have the exact same result at the end. So um, what this is showing is that fish, land reptiles, and land mammals have evolved to, uh, to be able to swim, right? They have fins, uh, they have the thing in the back, the tail, right? And all that to be able to swim through the water. So that's an example of uh, independent evolution. Basically, they evolved um, different, at different times with different um, branches, but they ended up with the exact same result. There's the same thing with magnetic reception. There's a lot of different organisms that have evolved independently to be able to sense magnetic fields, uh, but they're not necessarily from the exact same organism, uh, the same ancestor. And so what we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about, um, again, on the basis of convergent evolution, there's two ones that have actually been characterized, and they've been pretty well uh, developed in different organisms. So the first one is magnetotaxis. This is mostly in bacteria. So this one, bacteria, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but bacteria are able to actually sense magnetic fields in a specific way that can tell them uh, how the magnetic fields of the Earth are lined up, and they can tell them to go either north or south. Uh, electromagnetic induction is really cool too. This is for fish, it's mostly for shark and rays. Uh, they have a specific uh, gland and organ, right, that lets them do the exact same thing but in a different way. And then uh, these two are actually hypothesized. Uh, they're not exactly been characterized fully, uh, but they're kind of a hypothesis we made that we think uh, would be a very good uh, thing for all the other organisms that are able to sense magnetic fields, but we haven't exactly uh, figured out how. The first is iron clusters, and we're going to talk about that because that's kind of been refuted uh, very recently in the last five years. Um, and the one that we're going to be focusing on mostly today is quantum-based magnetoreception. So there's actually a uh, quantum nature to magnetoreception uh, down to um, subatomic sub particles that's able to give these different organisms the ability to sense magnetic fields. So the first one, 
So that's what I think a magnetotoxic bacteria looks like. It's pretty cute. Uh, so basically, these magnet magnetotoxic bacteria have these little organelles that are called magnetosomes. And they have these um, particles inside them. And uh, all those particles are made up of mostly, they're usually ferromagnetic iron oxides. Uh, they're just a specific type of particle, a specific type of compound that's inside these organelles. And um, there's another type of uh, particle that's found in there too, Carl, iron sulfide. And again, these were evolved independently, and it's just an example of um, convergent evolution. So iron sulfide, ferromagnetic iron oxide, magnetite, were just evolved independently, but they do the exact same thing. They're basically just a bunch of uh, clutters of these particles inside an organelle that are able to align uh, with the magnetic field of the Earth. So they align in a certain way, and that tells the bacteria, hey, the magnetic fields are going this way, and this is the way we have to move. So the bacteria will then move north or south, whichever way it wants to, following those magnetic fields. And this is one of the most basic ways that an organism can detect magnetic fields. But as you can uh, tell, this, all this is able to tell is what's north and what's south, right? So, so for some other organisms, especially for birds, this wouldn't be enough, right? You can't just tell what's north and what's south. You need a precise measurement because birds, again, like I said before, if they go over five degrees um, the wrong way, it can be fatal for them. So uh, even though this is good for bacteria, it might not be just as great for other birds or other animals. Now, these guys, Elasmo branch fish, uh, these guys go through something called electromagnetic induction. So rays and sharks do this, and uh, they're under a whole category called the last branch fish. And uh, this is just the first text slide. I try to do mostly pictures. But um, so basically what this is, is these uh, different animals, so sharks and rays, they have this organ in them, and it's called the ambulia lorenzi. And it's actually really cool. It's like this canal. There's an ambulatory canal in it, and water can flow through it. And as you guys might know, when uh, anything with a charge moves, it has a magnetic field, right? It makes a magnetic field. So what it does, uh, and that works vice versa too, if you have a magnetic field and you're moving, you're able to detect an electrical voltage. So it uses the latter. So what it does is it can swim, and the water through the uh, canal can actually move and create a voltage, and that voltage is detected by these epithelial cells in the ampullary canal. And uh, that basically tells the epithelial cells and the whole organism, hey, we have a voltage here, right? It's because of this magnetic field, and uh, this is the way the magnetic field is lined up. And again, this isn't using any type of quantum mechanics yet, right? Uh, this is just another method some organisms use uh, to detect uh, uh, your magnetic field. And uh, so this is sensitive used for direction navigation. That's what all these sensors are mostly used for, right? It's trying to tell the organism, hey, this is north, this is south, this is where I want to go, this is where I don't want to go, right? And it's going to be the same thing with birds, it's going to be the same thing with sea turtles. They're trying to tell where do we have to go. It's for navigation, right? And um, one really cool thing, and kind of bizarre, is that oceans by themselves uh, do move, right? And uh, they're moving against or for the magnetic field. So the oceans themselves can actually have an uh, electrical current as well. So these fish actually have to have a way to uh, differentiate the electrical signal that they're detecting from the ocean, the ocean's uh, electrical current as well. And the way they do that, it was described in this one research article that the um, uh, the organism moved their head left and right. And I couldn't give you the whole thing; I'm grossly sim oversimplifying it. But the, uh, because they move left and right, it kind of uh, lets them uh, not detect the ocean's electrical current and only detect their own. Uh, the one they made inside the canal. So that lets them basically isolate and reduce the noise so they're able to detect the magnetical field with like high precision. Now iron clusters. This is the one I said that um, is, has been kind of refuted recently. So a bunch of iron. It's cute. Uh, so basically iron clusters, what this was, was it was uh, actually found in pigeons and they have this, uh, th like it's almost like an organ at the top of their beaks. And what they thought it was is uh, they thought it was just a bunch of iron that almost did the exact same thing as magnetotactic, magnetotactic bacteria that we talked about earlier. That they would align in a certain way and that would tell the organism, the pigeon in this case, uh, which way the magnetic field was, right? Which was north and which was south. But just recently, I think it was about five years ago, a research team actually found out that these were just macrophages, which were just immune cells with a lot of iron in it. So it wasn't actually uh, found used for uh, any type of magnetic sensing. So now we're going to move on to the last one. So we talked about the two ones that were very well characterized. Uh, those were the magnetotactic bacteria, and then we talked about the ampullary canals in uh, the sharks and rays. So those are the ones that have been uh, basically 
uh, very well researched, right? They can use some more, but they've been pretty well researched, and we know that that's uh, how they work more or less. And then the other hypothesis was our iron cluster, and this is the second hypothesis, right? About organisms, we don't exactly know how they work, and this one's about um, uh, it's using a quantum uh, mechanics to basically show how magnetoreception could work. So, another cute little like, electron here. So, electrons themselves actually could be acted upon by magnetic fields. So, uh, an electron has a charge, right? And uh, those move, right? And those actually can be acted upon by any type of magnetic field around us. So, in this case, the Earth, right, around us. So, that actually lets the electron spin. So, every single electron and a, a few other subatomic particles as well have a spin. And uh, that spin is known as, uh, it basically makes up one of the quantum numbers. So as you guys, um, it's like uh, in chemistry class, we have four quantum numbers, right? And one of them is uh, your quantum, your spin, right? So every single uh, subatomic particle, right, uh, has a uh, quantum number, but we mostly focus on electrons and how electrons have their quantum numbers. And the quantum numbers kind of act like an address. So no two particles, no two subatomic particles have the exact same uh, qu four quantum numbers, right? So it's kind of very specific for each particle. And all those numbers kind of make up the quantum state. So what that means is, uh, think about like, you have an atom in the middle, and then you have big clouds, right, around it. So you might have seen like the one that looks like uh, the affinity sign, right, there's a big sphere, and there's other more complex ones as well. And that just shows it's a big probability cloud that the electron will most likely be found within that one cloud. So it's not an exact thing. Electron could be found like, you know, two miles down in like the McDonald's, but it most likely is in the probability cloud there. Uh, so this is what this next slide is. There's just a probability distribution uh, of where that electron or subatomic particle is found. Now we're going to get into some more quantum mechanics here. So uh, quantum entanglement is this really cool thing where if two electrons or two subatomic particles get close enough to each other, they actually get coordinated, so they fall in love. Right? They get super close and they basically correlate with each other and they'll basically do almost the exact same thing the other one does. So one thing to note is that they're not actually identical. So it's not that if one has a positive spin, the other one's going to have a positive spin. Or if one has a negative, the other one has a negative. All it means is that if one has a positive uh, and the other one has a negative, if one flips, the other one will flip as well. Right? And they'll keep flipping no matter what happens to one, the other one uh, will coordinate and do uh, whatever it needs to do to flip as well. So it's the mechanism that's the same, not necessarily that they're identical in themselves. And what's really cool is these like two uh, entangled particles can actually go really, really far apart. Um, in, on Earth, like here, research has only shown up to about 150 kilometers apart, and they're still entangled. So you can go up to 150 kilometers apart, that's almost like, that's halfway to Calgary, right? Two particles, two electrons can be like halfway to Calgary and still do the exact same thing, or the opposite thing, right, that the other particle is doing which is super cool, but it's actually been hypothesized that you can go way further than that, like light years away, and you can still have the exact same thing. So this can, uh, we're going to talk about it way later, like right at the end, that this can have a lot of actual um, uh, benefits in uh, when we're trying to uh, design technology as well. So um, we're going to go into more like how the bird uh, migration works. Does anyone have any questions so far? Uh, anything, review on any type? No? We're good? It's all right. Okay. So uh, Cryptocom C C R Y four cry four. I know it sounds depressing, but it's not. It's pretty cool. So basically, um, what these uh, birds have is in their eye on their retina, they have this uh, cryptochrome. It's basically this type of a uh, molecule, and the specific type we're going to talk about is cry four. So it's found in the back of the retina, and what it does is it actually detects blue light. So when blue light hits it, it's able to make these free radicals, right? So does anyone remember? Before I go to the next slide, anyone remember what free radicals are from chemistry? Yeah, some, some people, yeah, maybe. So basically, it's when you have um, one unpaired electron in the valence shell, right? So it's the outermost shell, and it'll have one unpaired electron in that valence shell. And all that means is that it's super reactive, but it's still neutral, right? So it's uncharged, but it's uh, super reactive with other uh, molecules. So what we're talking about here, so you have normal atoms. Uh, you have this guy, right, so it looks mean. And we have antioxidants, right? Uh, we're not going to talk about antioxidants here. We're just going to be focusing on our free radicals. So free radicals are made right when the blue light hits that um, cry four in the back of the eye of the uh, bird, right? So when it hits the uh, bird's eye, uh, it'll basically make these free radicals. And the free radicals are actually magnetic. And we're going to talk about a little bit about why. 
So it's actually, um, it's kind of weird. So normally when we think about electrical spin, magnetic, uh, and electricity and all of that, you think that a moving charge would have magnetism, right? They would have a magnet. So you would think that the electrons that have a spin already, right, would make a magnet by itself. But it's kind of weird, and I was kind of shook about this too. Um, just because it's spinning doesn't necessarily mean it's making an electrical field, uh, like a magnetic field around it. And that's not why it's magnetism. Uh, so uh, the best answer I can come up for it from what I've like, uh, try to find out about it is that if it has a spin, it just has magnetism. It's, it's just how like the quantum mechanics work. It just has magnetism, and it's not necessarily because it's spinning. It's just because it's spinning, it just does. And um, a spin in general, right? Spin is also called a uh, spin angular momentum. Uh, there's two quantum numbers that define it, right? So the one we've actually mostly talked about in the chemistry class and stuff like that is this one. Uh, spin projection number. So that's the one you guys think about, the negative one half and positive one half, right? So there's always two spins that you think about electron head, negative one half and positive one half, right? But one that's uh, kind of, uh, that leads up to that negative one half, positive one half, is something called the spin quantum number. Uh, that's denoted as S. So every single particle, every single subatomic particle has that S value. So for a electron, it's a one half. For other subatomic particles, it could be different. It could be negative five, it could be five, it could be six, right? It could be whatever integer. It could be any integer or half integer. Seven and a half, five, six, four, right? Whichever one. This uh, one right here, the spin projection number, the one we normally know about, so the negative one half and positive one half with electrons, uh, those uh, basically depend on what our S value is. So you take your S, make it a negative, right? You put a negative value in front of it and just add ones, right? So let's say your uh, spin quantum number is five. Uh, you'll take negative 5, and then uh, starting from negative 5, your spin, project your spin projection numbers could be negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, all the way to positive 5. So there will be a lot of spin projection numbers. This is really important because uh, 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 when you get coupling, and this is how the free radicals work. Okay, so electrons can actually couple together. They can get close, right? And this is the quantum entanglement we're talking about. When they come together, they couple to each other, and no matter how far they apart they go, if they flip, the other one will flip as well. And uh, what's really, really cool is that when they um, come together, um, we're not going to go through the math because that's equations, and I don't like equations. Um, in general, when you have an S equals 1, so that means when you have a spin quantum number of 1, you can have negative 1, 0, or 1 as your spin projection number. And that means that it's a triplet. There's three possibilities, it's a triplet. And when s equals 0, so when our spin uh, quantum number equals 0, your spin projection number is just, there's only one possibility, it's 0, right? It's a singlet. Now this is super important uh, because your free radicals, because they're paired up, because they're coupled, they can either be triplets or singlets, right? And uh, they display magnetism, like I talked about, because they spin, right? Because they spin, they inherently just have magnetism. And this is important because, um, so keep that in the back of your mind, right? We have our singlets and triplets. And uh, now we're going to talk about something a little bit different. So that was electrons, the type of spin they have, they, have, they can be singlets or triplets. We're going to talk about the actual atom right in the middle, right? The nucleus of the atom. And these atoms, depending on which ones you have, which uh, different atoms you're interacting with, they have these things called hyperfine interactions. These are super cool. Basically, what happens is, uh, when you have specific properties for an atom, so uh, there's a few different like, uh, criteria you have to meet, so I'm not going to go through those, but if you meet these certain criteria, those things themselves, the atoms, the nucleuses, can have a spin to themselves, right? The protons and the neutrons can have a spin as well. And uh, there's only two that we're actually going to worry about, that's hydrogen and nitrogen. Uh, the reason we only worry about them is because even though other atoms do have it, um, they're different isotopes, right? And because they're different isotopes, they're usually not seen as much. You'll find like 0, 0.0 something percent of them in on Earth, right? So we don't really care about them. They're kind of like the losers in a movie. Like, we don't talk about them, right? We forget about them. So all we talk about the ones that are actually um, going to be present, which is hydrogen and nitrogen. Almost 100% of all the hydrogen and nitrogen found in the world is going to be able to undergo these hyperfine interactions. Now, what are these things? Basically, uh, these make a magnetic field as well. Because we talked about the spin, anything with spin uh, inherently just has a magnetic field. Because it has a magnetic field, it can kind of mess with the electron's magnetic field as well. And that's important because, because they're messing with each other, again, gross oversimplification, right? But um, 
these interactions, just because of the fact that the electron has a spin, right, and it has magnetism, and your uh, protons in the middle, they have spin, right, and they have magnetism, they kind of mess with each other, and the electrons can jump from the triplet state to the singlet state, right? Uh, I don't know the exact mechanism, um, because it was like 60 pages long, and went over my head. Uh, so we're not, I'm not going to go into why they do that and how they do that. But um, the fact is that the interaction of those magnets um, and the protons and the electrons cause the interconversion, right? And what's really cool is when you have an external magnetic field, the Earth, right? That can actually cause a, um, a little bit different of the interconversion. That's called the Lamar frequency. So they'll oscillate. They'll go from triplet to singlet, triplet to singlet, back and forth. And the amount of time it takes to go back and forth is like a very specific number. And that number will change if you have an external magnetic field, which is the Earth, right? So you'll have a natural one, and then you'll have one because of the magnetic Earth that's slightly changed. And uh, what is thought is that birds can actually detect that change, right? The cry for it we talked about can detect that change in oscillation. Now, that's super cool and all, but all you've detected so far is the fact that uh, you have a north and south pole, right? And we talked about that's not sufficient for birds, right? So because of this whole uh, isolation, if you have a change, you'll be like, oh, you have a frequency, you have it shifted, and this is north and this is south. You don't know how much, you don't know which way, or anything like that. So how is that done? That's, thing, that's this whole like, thing called anos, anisotropy. anisotropy, anisotropy. Um, so basically, uh, this is what's going to give you direction, uh, your direction. So how this works is that you have a molecule, right? you have this specific uh, electron, and the Basically, depending on which way that uh, electron gets the magnetic field, like which direction it gets it from, it's going to react differently. It's going to have a little bit different of um, an effect on the change in frequency, right? So there's tiny little um, differences in the frequency that's changed because of this, uh, depending on where you get the different magnets from, right, from the proton. And same thing with the external magnets from the Earth. Depending on where they come from, right, um, and which way they're going from north to south, right? And where you are, uh, they'll hit them differently and uh, basically the birds are able to detect this from the cry for protein. So this is just talking about what we just talked about, right? The Lamar frequency and the number of singlets and triplets, right? Can depend on the exact orientation of those interactions and where they're coming from. And why that's important is because cry for can make a bunch of these radicals and they'll be aligned in a specific way, and they can detect which orientation they're from. And it gives them magnetic sight, right? And I'm going to show a picture on the next one. I thought it was like kind of insane. Basically, uh, they're actually able to see with their eyes um, what's hypothesized, that they can see with their eyes uh, what the north and south is. And I'll show you what that looks like, because it's kind of hard to understand. And basically, um, be basically how these uh, birds do this is they use that uh, proportion of how many triplets and how many singlets you have and the oscillation, right? And it uses all that, it combines all that information, and is able to allow for that magnetic site. So I'm gonna show you what that magnetic site looks like. Uh, this is what uh, one of the researchers said. It's, uh, they hypothesized this is what it looks like. So it's, uh, this is just a picture of a background, I think it was in Florida or something like that. And um, they just showed this vignette, uh, like a, basically like a shadow, right, of what they think the birds will see. So what would happen is you'll be, let's say you're going straight north. And then the bird kind of like with wind or something goes one specific way, right? They moved a shift a little bit to the left. They'll get this shift in the shadow, which will tell them, uh, hey, you're going a little bit to the left or you're going a little bit to the right. Uh, we have to change our direction again, right? And um, this is basically how that they know exactly what direction to go all the time, right? They'll be following what they see, right? And um, we kind of brushed on this, like it was like one word in one of the slides. Uh, but I'm just going to expand on a little bit more. Basically, uh, it's not just one free radical in the back of each cry for. There'll be a bunch, right? Because this has to be super precise, like we said. Uh, so there'll be a bunch of aligned uh, free radicals that will have to go undergo that quantum entanglement, right? Which is the electrons coupling together and then having that magnetic field uh, interact with them, causing all this to happen, right? And that's how they're able to go through all of that, um, uh, the sense of the magnetic fields around them. And this is the same thing, this is just south, right? The other one was north, uh, north, east, north, and northwest. I flipped them, northwest, north, and northeast. And same thing here, right? They flipped them too. Uh, east, southeast, south, southwest, and west. 
So here's just a few list of organisms that have uh, magnetoreception, right? There's the European finches, there's your zebra finches, sea turtles, you have uh, actually Drosophila, which um, are f fruit flies, right? Fruit flies actually might have this as well. Uh, arthropods, which are just your insects, right? Um, uh, they're known to have this as well, and mollusks, and actually, um, we're going to talk about this right at the end. Uh, humans might actually have a magnetic uh, sense as well, but it's kind of weird because obviously we don't know it, right? You can't see uh, magnetic lines everywhere, uh, but they've kind of shown it very recently. It was actually this year in March uh, that there's a paper that came out that kind of showed that uh, humans have some type of magnetic sense, and we're going to talk about that at the end. So we're just going to go through, uh, but before I touch on this, this is uh, just what can we use this for, right? Uh, what can magnetoreception teach us? Because like, honestly, at this point, it's like, okay, who cares, right? They're, they can fly really cool, right? Let's, yes, we learned something, but what can we use this for, right, in the future? So does anyone have any questions about something we've talked about so far? We'll have a question period at the end, too, but is there anything that's pressing right now? No? Okay, awesome. So we're going to go forward, right? And the most obvious one would be GPS, right? So GPS... Um, if you think about it, right now, what has to happen is you have a satellite, right? And your satellite has to feed your information, and that gives you the information of where to go, right? There are some new um, GPSs we have that you can actually download your specific city or a province, right? Uh, so you don't need a satellite that's following you all the time in case you go somewhere where um, you don't have satellite connection, for example, right? But there's still places where a satellite cannot go, right? And there's not in-depth... Um, basically in-depth analysis of the whole geographical region that can tell you uh, where you are, where you should go, or stuff like that. So in places like this, uh, a magnetic sense can actually be very useful because it's not actually that you're downloading a bunch of information to one device. What you're instead doing is kind of like a compass. It's like a very advanced compass, right? It's kind of telling you exactly uh, where you are, what you're doing, because of the magnetic field around you, right? Uh, using just a tool, right? Not a load of information. So it could be used in different GPS uh, systems. And uh, what's really cool about that is, um, let's say you're going to a different country, right, or something like that, and uh, it's super duper dark, right, and you don't have as much GPS uh, reception, you'd be able to use your um, magnetic uh, magneto reception, magneto reception uh, to be able to help you navigate a little bit more. Now, let's say even if you do have GPS, right, a uh, magneto reception can give you a little bit more information um, than just your typical other thing can, right, with. Uh, um, Basically, the more information you have, the better, right? So it can help a little bit. Now, is there anything else you guys can think of? This is, I know it's a hard question, so honestly, if no one answers, completely fine. But is there anything else you guys can think of that magnetic reception could be used for? I mean, I think it would be really cool with the whole idea of like self-driving planes. Mm -hmm. So like you could have planes that kind of just don't need a pilot because they know where they're going. Mm -hmm. That's actually really cool. I haven't thought of that either, right? But yeah, nothing about it. If, uh, Birds are able to fly with less than five degrees of uh, inaccuracy. Um, planes would be able to use that very well as well, right? And it's just one more thing that they can use uh, to help them go forward. Um, I think as well with like ships and stuff as well. I don't know the systems that they use currently, but it might be cool to have something along these lines that could help direct them and stuff, and it might make the technology a bit more advanced. Yeah, that's like uh, so everything is based off like the GPS uh, thing, right? So it's uh, in not just cars, right? Like I said, planes and boats and so forth. Uh, this can actually be used uh, to its advantage uh, to be able to help with where you're going, where you're navigating, and stuff like that, right? So it's just one more tool you can put in your toolbox that these different vehicles can use to get from one place to another. But now we're actually going to take a step back and talk a little bit broader because we talk about quantum entanglement, right? If you're able to understand uh, how uh, quantum entanglement works and how these different things are, because remember we talked about how the two things can be coupled and be light years away, it's Paul said they'd be light years away, and still be able to interact with each other, right? That's technically a form of communication, right? That they're undergoing that we can't get, right? Because, and we're gonna talk about that in a quick second. And uh, I'm kind of rushing ahead here, right? Uh, one more thing that I'm gonna talk about first before we get to the whole communication thing is uh, your multimodal integration. So all this means, uh, it's just a fancy word I found online, right, and I wanted to sound really smart. So basically what it means is you have a bunch of different senses and you're able to bring them all together cohesively and birds are able to bring them together, different organisms are able to bring them together uh, to have uh, an overall response that they want to do, that they want to overcome. And that's really important because a, a lot of different technologies are very um, uh, one-dimensional, right? They're able to do one thing very well, better than anyone else. Uh, better than any human, right, uh, in that one capacity. But they're not necessarily able, again, more recently it's changing, right, but uh, they're not able to as efficiently bring all the different senses together and integrate them in a way that a lot of biological 
systems are able to. So um, being able to just integrate quantum mechanics and integrate this type of quantum entanglement into machines, right, and have it interact with your visual, with your hearing, with any other type of information uh, would be very beneficial, right? Because then uh, machines would be able to do so much more, integrate so much more without uh, necessarily having us uh, connect the pieces for them. And also, not just using uh, our uh, biology to lead to technology. So what we were just talking about is how we can use our biological systems we have now and how we have all these uh, fishes, how we have all these birds and sea turtles, right? That have these really cool biological systems and make us a tech basically make us technology and help us make technology, right? Based off those systems as like an inspiration. We can actually go the other way around too, obviously, right? We can use technology to help discover those systems in the future as well, right? So it kind of goes hand in hand. But the really important thing, takeaway thing here, is uh, you can use biological, um, biological systems as inspiration for innovation, right? You can start off a framework of something that's already been molded through evolution, right? Start with that, use technology to kind of uh, recreate that as a first step, right? And then you can go above and beyond, right? Uh, above what you can do, and then and you can go back and forth. Now the next thing, um, this quantum entanglement in communication, there's two sides of this, right? Uh, there's like a big, there's a debate going on, not a big debate, because obviously I never heard about it, but there's a debate going on, right? So basically what it was, was that um, because the particles are too, like, very far apart and they communicate with each other, what was said was, um, I'll tell you a story, right, to communicate, this will help. So let's say you have one guy on one side of the earth, right, and he has a friend, let's say Mark, okay, he's my friend. And he's saying he's going to go across the world and he's going to go dig up some jewels, okay, he's going to go try to find some raw jewels, right, and he's going to try to go dig them up across the world. And he takes one of the subatomic particles with him, I don't know how, but he takes one with him and he leaves one with me. And he said what he's going to do is he's going to flip the orientation of one, and if he does so, uh, it means he's found something I should go with him to help, right? Um, that type of communication is almost, I think, above 10,000 times faster than light, right? So if that's able to happen, right, that's a type of communication that can be very, very fast. Now, the opposite side was that that's physically impossible because with the whole entanglement thing, the second you force one particle to flip orientation, it's not entangled anymore. Right? So that kind of messes up that whole theory, right? That you can use it for communication. However, it can actually be thought of as uh, being used in cybersecurity. And let me tell you how. So let's say you have two people, right? And you give them a private key. And um, uh, the key is quantumly entangled, right? And only those two know of that key. The thing is, if a second, or sorry, a third person tries to find out what that key is, or tries to measure either of those keys, it would uh, cause the entanglement to stop, right? It wouldn't be entangled anymore, so the key wouldn't work, right? Again, uh, there's a huge, like, a lot of research on the security, and I got it uh, mostly brought up. I tried to add it in at the end because of that uh, lecture we had last time, right? Um, there is a lot of research going on with quantum security and quantum cyber security. So um, the whole premise that uh, quantum security would be able to hack through absolutely anything not necessarily holds true because there is a lot of quantum uh, cybersecurity that's being researched and brought forward now, right? And uh, I actually saw this, I was actually very surprised. Uh, the first time that they started talking about quantum uh, cybersecurity and talking about different ways that it could be used was back in the 90s, right? Early 90s. So uh, it's been 20, 30 years since then, right? So we've come a long way, right? So we've been talking about it for a while. So it's not, um, now can we say that it'll come to consumer products? Not necessarily, maybe not now, right? Maybe not in 20 years but uh, it possibly can in the future, right? So it's not necessarily saying that uh, one person with a quantum computer, computer would be able to mess up absolutely everything we have, right? And quantum entanglement that we may possibly learn from biological systems like your uh, birds, like your sea turtles, right? Can help learn, help us understand quantum entanglement better that can be used in technologies like these, right? So even though it doesn't seem connected, it can be, right? And there's a lot of other um, technologies we've made that were based off biological systems before. So it's just something to think about. Now I told you this is the last two slides here, um, that humans actually have a magnetic sense as well. Uh, looks super complicated, it's like kind of not, I feel like a lot of these researchers just put something very complicated on, but it's pretty, it's not, right? They just kind of make themselves sound smart. So basically all this was is a box and they just replicated the Earth's field, right? The Earth's uh, magnetic field without letting the Earth's magnetic field in. And what they found is they sat a person in them 
And they found that um, without any other stimuli, I'm not entirely sure how they brought out all the other, um, uh, how they controlled for all the other uh, variables, uh, but they detected the earlier this year that there's some alpha waves that they detect every time they uh, play the magnetic field through. Right, so um, that alpha waves that were found in the brain through an EEG was found to basically be very similar to other senses like your visual, auditory, and your somatosensory, so your touch as well. So it's super similar to that, the type of waves that they're found in the brain, but they did find waves, so that's a really cool thing, right? And this is just another picture of that um, box um, of how they sat someone inside it, right? And they isolated everything else, they had an EEG connected to them, right? and they played uh, the magnetic fields and they saw a response, uh, an alpha wave response in them. Again, um, not entirely sure of the entire mechanism, right, of how they did it and how they controlled for the other variables, uh, but they were able to, and it was a peer reviewed, it was a good article from what I read, right, it seemed like they had a lot of samples, everything else, and they were able to detect some alpha wave activity uh, because of a change in magnetic field, which can show that humans have some type of response. And the thing I thought was really cool about this is humans actually have the same uh, cryptochromes in the back of our eyes, but before we never thought they were used for anything, right? People did try to research them, but nothing came out of that. But this just shows that there is some type of response, but we have no idea what type of mechanism is used to get there. All right, and final slide here. Do you guys have any questions? So the, the poles, the magnetic poles, both north and south, are moving, right? Yes. They, they are moving because the center of the Earth is molten, and that's where the magnetic field comes from. So how, how, how does that influence everything that you have talked about? It, it, it adds a little bit of uncertainty, if, but our, I guess what one can say is, if the poles are moving in a predictable way, well, you can just factor that in. So is this movement of the poles predictable or random? And what's your understanding of how that so, would factor um, in? It was actually near the end of the article, they kind of talked about that, right? They kind of said um, the North Poles are not stable, right? They're not always in the exact same spot at the exact same time all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what I understood from it was that uh, the way, uh, we'll talk about birds first, the biological aspect, right, and then the technological aspect afterwards. So the biological aspect of it, birds actually do change their migration patterns slightly, right, uh, because of those magnetic uh, changes as well, right? Um, so they're able just to adapt with the slight changes, right, because it's not a massive change. It's not like you're completely shifting where the bird is going, right? It'll be a slight deviation, right, but it's right. still within the five degree range for them. Right. Right? But the problem comes where, let's say we want to use that same type of technology for ourselves, right? if we want to develop that. That would be a big problem with us, because if we're trying to use it for GPS and navigation, that wouldn't necessarily be um, optimal, right? that we have something slightly changing every year, because then you have inadequate um, navigation. Right? Uh, so I think the best uh, basically result for that was to have, uh, again, different machines that uh, use in conjunction. I don't think uh, just a magneto magnetoreception by itself would be sufficient to guide someone through uh, an area, right, or drive a plane, or uh, go through a boat. I think it has to be used with other receptors, but it's something that can add a little bit more certainty uh, to the other types of um, receptors and other types of sensors you have. So even though it's not an exact science, right, uh, as I understand it, it's not necessarily exact, you can kind of uh, mitigate by a predictable patterns, like you said, right, there are some predictable um, magnetic patterns that you have, uh, and that's why when you search up, if you try to search up the magnetic poles and the magnetic fields of the Earth, you can find very exact uh, drawings, or not drawings, but um, animation simulations of the Earth and how they are this year as compared to 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right, and so forth. So I think if we combine that type of information technology with um, the magnetic reception, and then you use other types of sensors as well, when it all comes together, I think that would help mitigate all the um, different type of uncertainty right. you have. Well, I mean, the other overarching consideration is that reality itself is quantum, right? So, mm -hmm. it, to that extent, you know, we're saying that if we were going to use this, it would have to work perfectly, you know, so that with all other factors would, would, would be filtered out so we'd know exactly where we were going. But if it's really true that our reality itself is quantum and we only think it's, it's like rigid and, you know, that actually observing it changes it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what does that mean? But, 
<laughs> that's sort of what that would mean, right? Mm -hmm. That by observing some part of reality, you're actually changing it. Well, that also introduces error. Mm -hmm. So we can't really require that humans have a completely error-free life because we probably don't have that now. We, 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 we assume that our external reality is tangible, fixed, you know, and, and, and something we can count on. And that's a, it's an assumption that doesn't work badly, but it's probably not actually true. So I think um, when it comes to that type of uncertainty, right, that type of um, just reality by itself is changing, and the reality itself just depends on what you see, um, I think uh, even though that does introduce error into the equation, right, and uh, not any everything can be specifically exact, I think that type of uncertainty, if you acknowledge it, if you acknowledge its presence, right, it can kind of not necessarily be beneficial, but you can kind of mitigate um, the different errors that could result if you didn't. So if you uh, just make a technology, for example, a quantum type of uh, technology that's based off of um, some type of biological system, and even though it might not be exact by itself, I think the changes that will happen over years, right, uh, can help it adapt. And that's when other types of artificial learning and machine learning that we have, right, can help it adapt by itself without any, without any human intervention. And it's really cool to bring up the whole, um, when, some, when you observe something, reality can change, right, and change it by itself. Because it kind of brings up the whole thing about the electron, right, and because technically, um, even though it's very unlikely, right, Technically, on a quantum state, um, I think we were talking about a few years ago in one of my classic chemistry classes, it is possible for like your entire body to teleport to another room because remember your uh, all your electrons and all your atoms right that have a spin are just a clouds of probability. So it is possible, very very low chance of probability, but it's possible that all of them move in the exact same spot in a different spot at the exact same time. So not everything is necessarily concrete in the exact same spot as what we see, right? And again, will you ever see that? No, right? Uh, well, I don't think so. Maybe you will, right? Maybe there'll be a way to um, bring that up. But as we stand, I think we have to just acknowledge um, the possibility that, and the, basically the understanding that it's there. And that can help you still create technology without being fearful that um, what's happening is not necessarily what is happening and what you think is right. happening. Yeah, I think both of those things, uh, teleportation will be a reality someday. And you know, communication via thought will be, right? But it's sort of crazy for us to say, okay, well, when that happens, what will the rules be? How will it, how will it behave? <laughs> we don't know, right? We, we'll find out when we get there. So. Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. Like, yeah. um, it's kind of like, when it happens, we'll, we'll deal with it then, right? Because we think about all these ethical dilemmas and ethical consideration now, right? And I think it's very important to think about them in advance, right? But you won't know the depth and the breadth of everything uh, you need to consider until it happens, right? So as much as you can uh, think of ethical consideration before, and I think you should, right? You'll have to, you have to also understand that things can change when you do actually get into the reality of what's happening, right? And even though you had a framework before going into it, you might have to adapt that framework of what's happening now because things aren't necessarily exact of how you predict it. Right. So one, one thing that I've realized recently, a lot of times when you talk about ethics and science and AI, somebody brings up the trolley problem. Well, doggone it, you know, we haven't solved the trolley pro problem. Well, this summer, I think it's two summers ago, when uh, Pokemon Go was, was a really big thing in town. And all these people were stuck to their phones searching for rare Pokemon. So what happened then? There were collisions on the road between two people searching for Pokemon. But they were also driving way under the speed limit because <laughs> they weren't paying attention to driving, they were looking for these rare Pokemon. And so nobody died. You know, you, you can say, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? We've got all these people stuck through their phones and going to run into each other. And that happened. And I saw one of those accidents. The cars were going about four miles an hour <laughs> and they sort of <laughs> came to a stop, right? So some of those trolley problems will be like that that, yeah, you'll, you'll have a vehicle that you can't stop before it hits the person, but it hits the person so gently 
that the person's able to just like push it away because it's almost stopped by the time that it gets there, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you can't think about these things as if this is a line in the sand, man, and if you can't give me the solution to the trolley problem, I'm going to declare that AI progress is halted and that's it. You know, I mean, it just isn't like that. That, 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 <laughs> that human beings, when we get to these points, we're, we're going to have to figure out things. It, it'll be flexible. But some of the collisions will be such low velocity that nobody's hard, you know. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much for that.